Well, for those of you that were listening online last Sunday and were worshiping online, you would have experienced some technical difficulties. And so I find the message so important of what we talked about on Sunday that I want to give you just a short version of what it was that we discussed so that you could either begin or finish the sermon that unfortunately cut out. We appreciate your patience as we are learning a lot of things on the live stream. But one of the things that I wanted to discuss about the erosion of America is the idea of the erosion of valuing human life. There's a lot that's going on in our culture. There's a lot that's going on in our world. Talking about which lives matter, certain lives matter, are certain people left out. But let me tell you something. The lives of unborn American citizens are being slaughtered by the thousands. I recently read a little book advocating for a pro-life position that was written in 1985. And the author said, we're up to 17 million babies that have been destroyed and murdered in the womb. You know what's sad is? We're up to 60 million babies that have been destroyed, murdered, cast aside in the womb. At one time in history, the womb was the most safe place one could be. But now we live in a world where it matters whether you're born in a state like Alabama or you're born in a state like New York that says abortion is okay, acceptable, murder is okay, all the way to the point that the mother would be driving to the hospital to have the baby. And so, as I am so impassioned about this, I became recently even more so, and I know that the Lord helped me and used it in my life, I finally watched the movie Unplanned, which is the story, the true story, of Abby Johnson, who is a former Planned Parenthood director. And she came to Christ, she came out of that culture of death, and is now a pro-life advocate, seeking to help people be informed and understand that the lives in the womb are human beings who deserve to be protected. You know, our Constitution says that all people have an inalienable right to the equality of life. But in our culture now, all of that is true except for the unborn. Everybody has a right to free speech except for the unborn. And so the main idea on Sunday was this, that you and I must stand against the systematic dehumanization of America's unborn citizens. And I'll say that again. There's a lot going on there. We must stand against the systematic organized effort, the systematic dehumanization of America's unborn little citizens. And I drug my feet on watching the movie Unplanned not because I needed to be convinced of the pro-life position. Not because I needed to be convinced that the unborn in the womb are humans, but because I'm angry about it. I'm not angry in some uncontrolled way that I'm going to fly off the handle, but I am angry that children in the womb don't have a right to life. And I knew that watching that movie would be so hard for me because I'm angry and I'm emotional about it and I knew it was just going to be hard. And yeah, there were times I was up pacing around in the room while I was watching it. Yes, there were times that my wife asked me, are you okay? But let me tell you something. You need to watch that movie. Because for those of us who understand and believe what God says about humanity and human life, we are too silent about the issue. I think it's because we don't see it. We're not around it. We're not always talking to people about it. But we can't be silent anymore. You must be angry about this issue that causes you to do something. The old reformer Martin Luther said, I never really do anything good until I'm good and angry. And what he meant was, get some passion for the unborn. Get some passion for them. 
So as you think of Psalm 139, this is where we were on Sunday in Psalm 139, where the psalmist is giving us a picture of life in the womb and what God thinks about life in the womb. And no doubt the author of Psalm 139 did not have abortion, the issue on its mind, which of course didn't come about. Nobody was thinking about that kind of stuff. The the technology and all the things that are in place of this culture of death were not in place at this time. But yet, the psalmist is giving us some high theology, but he's giving it us in the context of a relationship he has with God. A relationship that is so deep that even in the womb, God was there with him. So Psalm 139, we jump into the context where he's talking about God's omniscience and his omnipotence and his omnipresence, that no matter where I am, God is with me. And he cares about every one of these little unborn children. And he says in Psalm 139, verse 13, You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious. Verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, there are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. What we need in our culture is to pray that God will bring us again to 1972. You might have seen Abby Johnson speaking recently, wearing a necklace in which she had 1972 attached around her neck. And you know what 1972 represents? 1972 was the last time in this country that babies were safe in the womb. That our American citizens, our unborn future generations of the United States were safe. We need 1972. And we need God to bring us there. Now I want to give you, as I did last Sunday, I want to give you an acrostic that will help you stand against the systematic dehumanization of America's unborn citizens. Because the argument is around the fact that people who believe it's okay to slaughter children in the womb, they argue that those babies, or what they would say is those things, or that blob of cells is not a human. And I want to give you a little acrostic to remember. And it's in the acrostic of the word SLED. S-L-E-D. SLED. And each one of these represents a way in which people try to argue that the unborn are not human, but you will see as we walk through this acrostic that that argument and that logic falls flat on its face. Because if it can be proven that the unborn are human beings, not only from God's Word, as we clearly have seen, but also just clearly from an understanding of logic and reason, that it is absolutely wrong, sinful, murder, to kill our American citizens. A lot of discussion about citizens, a lot of discussion in our culture about immigrants and people coming to this nation. We are a nation of immigrants. But can't we get back to being a nation of our own children? God help us. So the acrostic sled, first letter is S. And S stands for size. Size. What people will say is, oh, here's essentially the argument. The child, that that thing in the womb is so small, it's not a person. It's so small, it's not a person. So they're arguing that the idea of a person's size determines their human value. We don't determine a human's value based on their size. 
A toddler is smaller than a teenager. A teenager is smaller than a young adult. A young adult is not grown and matured into full adulthood. We would never value a person's humanity based on their size. You see it clearly in Psalm 139. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you. The picture is the tiniest spark of life at the moment of conception. Humanity is born. We don't base a human value based on size. We don't say tall people are more valuable than short people. We don't say toddlers are more valuable than teenagers. So S stands for size. Well, what's the next one in the acrostic? Well, that's L. And L stands for level of development. So the argument that people will say is, but that thing in the womb has not developed into either looking like a human or being able to exercise human capabilities. Therefore, it is not a human. But again, that argument falls flat on its face. Because we do not base the value of a human based on their developmental skills. My little child, who's almost a year old, can't talk very well. Says mama, dad, dad, mostly mom. And lets you know when he's hungry. He hasn't developed these skills. He's He's developing the skills of learning how to grip things and hold on to things and stand up and take steps. Would we ever say that my little child is not fully human? He's not a human. His value is based on how well he's developed. We would never say that. A toddler is not as developed as a teenager. So it doesn't matter if the child in the womb is not fully developed into exercising the capabilities of, full, of a full-grown adult, we don't base the value of a human being based on how well they've developed. If you take that logic and you go to the end of life, would we then say that a person at the end of life who is struggling with Alzheimer's, maybe, they, maybe they're struggling and they're in a vegetable state, or they're not breathing on their own, would we say that they're not human? No, we would, they don't, they don't, we would never say they have had their humanity and then they lost their humanity. So size, we don't base the value of a human being on size. L is level of development. We don't base human value on the level of development that a person is in. E is environment. So the argument, so this is E, We've seen size, we've seen level of development, now we're on E, which is environment. And the argument is basically this, well, because that child is in the womb, it's a part of the mother's body, therefore it's kind of like an appendix. The mother can decide whether she wants that or not. The baby's in a totally different environment. We don't base the value of a human being on what environment they may or may not be in. I mean, this is a really kind of silly example, but it, the logic rings true. Just because someone is in outer space in a completely radical environment does not make them any less human. Just because when they were on the moon and took the first steps and the giant leap for mankind, we wouldn't say that they became less human because they were in a different environment. Just because a child in the womb practices breathing by breathing in and out the amniotic fluid, although they've not breathing in actual oxygen, we, we would never say that child is not a human just because it's in the environment of the womb. A seven-inch trip to the outer world doesn't all of a sudden magically make a baby a human being. I mean, the psalmist, when you think of well, how far we've already come, size and level of development and environment, that's what he's talking about here. Size, level of development, environment, 
Verse 13, You formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You get a close-up on the skin, it really just looks like woven fabric, back and forth, back and forth. I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And I said this on Sunday, and I'll say it again. You might think this is radical, and I'm going to say it anyway. God is pro-life. Period. End of story. Oh, you're being political! No, I'm not being political. The issue of abortion is a moral issue. The pro-life terminology may be politicized, but that word expresses a moral understanding that God is pro-life. God values all life all the way down to the moment life sparks at conception in the womb. We've seen size. We've seen level of development. We've seen that environment does not determine the value of a human being. Well, what is the last one? I think this is an important one. This is D. This is degree of dependency. Again, this is the argument. Well, that thing in the womb, they wouldn't say child and they would not say baby, that fetus, we come up with terminology that makes us feel good about slaughtering. That fetus, that child in the womb, is so dependent on the mother, it could never live without the mother. Therefore, that baby, that thing, can be discarded if the mother decides it's her choice and we'll call it health care. That's one of the things that amazed me about the movie, and Unplanned, is that you've got to understand that the organization of Planned Parenthood is out to sell abortions like they sell week vacations. Like they're, like they're trying to draw you in to get you to do it so they can use the parts and use the money to do whatever they want with. It's absolute wickedness. I'll spare you some of the details of things I have watched about how individuals in the third trimester having an abortion and being sent to the hospital because of complications and the doctors finding parts still inside the mother are babies. You've got to stand up. You've got to be a voice for them. We can be silent no more. If God is going to revive this nation, it better start with valuing life. All life. All the way down to babies' lives at the moment of conception. So the argument is that the the baby is so dependent on the mother, it can't be human. But you realize that logic, again, falls flat on its face. Because there are times that all of us are dependent on another human being for life in our lives. My little, almost one-year-old Aaron will crawl up to me Grab If I stay in one spot, he'll, he'll grab onto my leg, he'll pull himself up, and he'll just look up at me and yell. And I know that particular yell, that particular noise is, he is hungry. But you know, if I or my wife were to just simply say, you know what, you're not really human unless you can completely depend on yourself, my little child wouldn't survive. So the idea that because the child in the womb is dependent on the mother, therefore it's not human, falls flat on its face because my one-year-old is dependent on me for life. I would venture to say up even into five, six, seven, eight years, you could not leave them alone or they would not survive. Does that mean they're not human? Does that mean we can discard them? Does that mean at the end of life when parents are completely dependent on us, when someone's dependent on a breathing tube, when someone's dependent on every aspect of their life for food, water, shelter, clothing, all these things, they're not humans? Discard them? No. Because God values human life. And you don't know something? We're all dependent on God. That's really what the psalmist is getting at. From the, from the moment of my life's beginning all the way through, I am dependent on God. Even those who are unbelievers, who outright reject God, you are breathing His air. And you are dependent on Him for life. And he, He's giving it to you at this moment. And we can't forget, in all of this discussion, 
that there are many who have been duped and lied to and convinced that discarding their child was the right thing to do and they live with the pain and the shame and the regret and the remorse of knowing in their conscience that they discarded their own child. Brothers and sisters, we must offer them grace. We must be ready to open arms to realize that we must be sharing the Gospel and giving hope that there is forgiveness for the sin of abortion. There is forgiveness at the foot of the cross. And you can find freedom in knowing that God will forgive you and God will wash you clean of that sin. But wherever you're at in this scenario, it is clear that God's asking us to speak up. To stand for the lives of the unborn who have no voice, who cannot speak. And I, and I really leave you with this. And we In Proverbs, in Proverbs, we are given another admonition as I close. In Proverbs 24, verse 11, it says, Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, now listen to me, if you say, if I say, behold, I had no idea it was this bad. I didn't really know it was going on that much. Behold, if we say we did not know this, does not he, does not God who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay a man according to his works? We, brothers and sisters, have a responsibility to stand against the systematic dehumanization of America's unborn citizens. And as I mentioned, at the moment that my first son, I have two boys, and the moment my first son was born eight years ago, in the joy, in the excitement, in holding my newborn, the first thought was, is, how, could we, how could we allow in our country people to hurt or discard this child? And when I get angry, and I get impassioned, I write music. That's just what I do. So I wrote a song that I shared last week, and if you didn't get a chance to see it, I'll share it now with you. And the song is called God Alone Can Take. What part will you play? Will you stand up? Will you vote for life? Someone say, you're a one-issue voter if you only vote for a candidate that supports a pro-life agenda. You want to know what? Then you can call me a one-issue voter because if it means saving the lives of human beings, you better believe I'm a one-issue voter. Lots of things matter to me, but that rises to the top. And you cannot deny that what is set before you, even this coming election, is an agenda of death for the unborn or an agenda of promoting life. Use your vote to vote for life. And I hope this song encourages you as you think about the lives of these little American citizens. Thanks for watching. Joyful news, no announcement to be had, just a child unwanted, and never wanted a moment of their lives. And for such a small price They take a little life Believing it's not human 
Although they knew it and did it anyway If they only knew the Savior Redeemer If they only knew that we are fearfully and wonderfully made No voice And these children had no choice And the hands that had harmed them Missed the joy they could have had If they only knew the Savior, Redeemer, if they only knew In a world where the animals have more rights than boys or girls It's time, it's time to stand and where two wrongs make a right And they justify it in their minds It's time, it's time to stand and say That we are fearfully, wonderfully made And planned all my days Before they ever came Amazing God Out of everything you've made We are Fearfully, wonderfully For the glory of your name Fearfully, wonderfully made And given life that you alone can take God alone can take oh, God alone can Say